What defines success? There is a strong opportunity to believe in yourself, trust that you are amazing at what you do, and ask for what you think is fair and right. What happens when you get knocked down? I was afraid they were going to shut down my magazine if I told them I was pregnant. So I finally did tell my boss, and he said to me, are you going to keep it? What makes some people radiate? It really is about making yourself uncomfortable and putting yourself in these situations where you have to stretch yourself a little bit. A lot of these things just take practice. I mean, when I think of the number of things that I was uncomfortable doing in my career, it's just staggering. This is Radiate. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Radiate, the show where we interview some of the world's most successful people to find out how they work their way to the top. This week, we have a very special episode. We have two guests who joined us for Radiate's first ever live panel. It was held at the flagship retail store of a fashion startup called Of Mercer. Joining us were Susan Line. She's the founder of BBG Ventures, which is the venture arm of AOL that backs women-owned companies. And Daniela Yakovsky, the co-founder of Bobble Bar, the online jewelry retailer. Both women offer their unique insights into what it takes to build a new generation of women leaders and what challenges they faced on their way to the C-suite. You're going to be floored by some of their stories. So here we go with Daniela Yakovsky and Susan Line. Let me just start off with the first question to Daniela first, since, since you're next to me here. I see here lots of young women here. They all want to ask, you know, how do we get to the C-suite, right? And maybe we, we don't even talk about the C-suite first because how do you even get to your next promotion? So tell me first what you think has really helped you in your career. So I think a really big piece, and, and I think something that as you think about being women in the workplace, because I know this is a big topic, especially as we talk about equality in terms of the pay gap, I think that one thing that women um, tend to do more so than men is they doubt themselves. And I think that you really see this, um, especially around pay gap, is women are far less likely to ask for a higher salary or ask for the raise or ask for the promotion. Um, and I think that there is a strong opportunity to believe in yourself, trust that you are amazing at what you do, and ask for what you think is fair and right. Um, so I think as you think about you know navigating the workplace and moving yourself into higher positions, and I say this now um, as somebody who runs a business, has over 100 employees, and I see it time and time again with our female employees versus our male employees, I know that when I am hiring a man, 99% of the time, he will negotiate his salary up front when I make an offer. I cannot say that that is the same percentage for women. It is significantly lower. Um, So I think that we really owe it to ourselves to ask for what we believe that what we deserve. So why do you think that is? Honestly, I'm not sure. You know, I think that giving you a platitude of, oh, we're nicer or, oh, we're more gentle is is mildly insulting. Um, I'm certainly the type of person who isn't afraid to ask for what I want. I don't think anyone has ever deigned to call me shy. Um, And I can tell you that in one of my earliest jobs working in private equity, um, one of the, my my male counterpart, there were only two of us at my level, was let go less than a year after we first started. um, And I was asked to take on quite a bit of his work. And I learned that I was making a pretty substantial amount less than him. And it was really because when they made me the offer for the job, I was happy to just take it. And he wasn't. He negotiated. And it had nothing to do with skill level or competence. It was that he asked and I didn't. And that that was it. Well, Susan, I mean, you've been across the aisle from many people who've come to you for raises, right? I mean, can you fairly say that you would react the same if it was a man asking you for a raise or a woman asking you for a raise? Well, I always cheer women asking me for a raise <laughs> because it's true. They, they don't as frequently. I used to say that I could count on one hand the number of women who would come in outside of the normal cycle, right? There's one time a year when you're supposed to be be looking at whether you're going to get a promotion, you're going to get a raise. I could count on one hand the number of women who who came to me out of cycle and asked for a raise or a promotion, and I could count on one hand the number of men who had not. That's changed. So I would say in the last 18 months... Um, I see it just much more frequently, and I think it's a lot because of of organizations 
who are talking to women on a regular basis, events like this, where women hear, okay, it's okay to do that, right? Just the fact of talking about it, I think, changes behavior. Um, and there's just no question that I see, I, you know, maybe 50% of my direct reports over the last 18 months um, have come in and sat down and had really thought hard about why they were going to ask for this and what they were going to ask for. So it was not random, um, and they were all nervous, and it was great. But do they ask the same way? Do they ask in almost the same way? Um, no. Um, I, I think that, uh, and I, I hate generalizations where we say, no, women do it this way and men do it that way, but... Um, I do think that that because this is still a newly learned behavior, that women are more thoughtful, have have planned it out a lot more, have a, you know, six talking points they've really thought through that is they're comfortable with asking at the end of that for more. Um, so I... Uh, I'm sure that will change, too, mm -hmm. as, as women get more comfortable doing it. But a lot of these things just take practice. I, I mean, when I think of the number of things that I was uncomfortable doing in my career, it's just staggering. Everything. Um, even doing something like this. I would never have volunteered to, to get up in front of a room and, and do a panel. But you learn things by doing them. And, and I think that's the... Um, the big message is make yourself a little uncomfortable. So do you feel, I'm curious, do you feel as women leaders in business that you're held to a different standard? I don't know that you're necessarily held to a different standard, but I do think that with a large portion of the audience who perhaps aren't used to working for women leaders or aren't used to working with women leaders, they definitely come in with a preconceived notion of what you're going to be like. Um, and I think that working past that can be very difficult. But again, to Susan's point, it really is about making yourself uncomfortable and putting yourself in these situations where you have to stretch yourself a little bit. But can you give an example? Like, like you know, when did you find that, that you were basically stereotyped? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you, I've probably seen it throughout a large bulk of my career. I mean, before I started Bobble Bar, most of my career was in finance. So I was used to working with largely male groups. I worked in investment banking for two years and private equity for two years. And I was used to working primarily with men. And I think you definitely get the small comments about, oh, are you being emotional? Are you being a woman? Um, you know, you definitely see it. I mean, I think in terms of a story that's probably most salient, um, we, you know, had a very senior person who had been working for us was in the C-suite in our office. And my co-founder is also female. And there is a person on his team that we had wanted to let go for quite some time. And we had had the regular check and given him feedback about areas that we wanted him to improve upon. And after, I think, it was now at the two, two and a half month mark where we had given very clear feedback on changes that we wanted to see that hadn't been made. And at this point, we sat with his direct manager and said, okay, we've had multiple check-ins, we've had multiple requests, and we haven't seen a change. You know, do you think that now would be the appropriate time to make the hard decision to let this individual go? Um, and, and he got very flustered and literally sitting in a room with me, my female co-founder, our head of HR, and our COO actually said, well, I don't want it to seem like we were just a bunch of women in the room making a fast decision. Uh, and I mean, first of all, my jaw hit the floor because I'm your boss. And are you kidding? And the head of HR is here. And not that I would make it, you know, an HR issue. I think, you know, we're fortunate in that we're, you know, we're we are a smaller company. So I, I have the liberty. Fortunately, at that point, I had the liberty to just be like, you're an asshole. Get out of here. Uh, now I would have to be more careful. But, you know, you, you do occasionally have those, you know, moments happen where you are just floored that someone would even think that, let alone allow the synapses in their brain to say, yes, okay, to speak this out loud. Right. I mean, like staggering. Um, but you, you, you deal with that and you have to figure out how to move on from that. And really, I think the best thing that you can do is, you know, file that away and remember it, but not overly react to an absurd statement. I mean, the reaction is that is so extraordinarily unprofessional and so unbecoming of anyone who would deign to call themselves a leader within an organization. But did it make you sad in a way because maybe what he was thinking was not out of the ordinary? Um, it 
it made me sad more from the perspective that how sad for you that that is the viewpoint with which you go through life and that there are so many people out there who are doing interesting things who are women and you will never really appropriately see that for what it is and you will probably miss a lot of really extraordinary opportunities and that's unfortunate for you and you know bye Felicia move on that's it <laughs> what about you Susan I mean look you've you've gone through so many different industries you've you fought your boardroom battles as well I mean you must have some war stories too Come on, fess up. Well, look, the world has changed dramatically. I've been working for 40 years now, so a long time. Um, And uh, in the early days, I was often the only woman at the table. But I've seen such incredible changes in most industries in my work life. So I I was in media for many years, Uh, magazines and then television. Um, I was... I had just launched a magazine when I got pregnant with my second child, and I, I hid the fact that I was pregnant because I was the editor-in-chief, and I was afraid they were going to shut down my magazine if I told them I was pregnant. Really? You actually thought they were going to shut down I, the I magazine because really you were possible, pregnant? I really thought it was possible because it was new enough that, you know, I just didn't know what they were going to do. Wow. So I finally did tell my boss, and um, he said to me, are you going to keep it? So that would not happen anymore. I just got like, I just got like chills. That like would that not is... happen anymore. So, uh, you know, and it was one of those things where if you were working, it was just water off a duck's back. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, do you think I would have told you if I wasn't going to keep it? <laughs> uh, the, the world has in fact shifted dramatically in those almost 30 years. So she's now 27. Um, so maybe 28 years ago. Uh, There are still industries, however, and this is what staggers me, that feel like that world years back. And it's very interesting. Finance is one. Um, Definitely venture capital. Uh, You know, 4% of venture capital partners, that's not the people who work at these firms, but people who actually make the investment decisions, 4% are female. That's just incredible. So that's the main reason, I think, that you see so little venture capital going to women entrepreneurs. And I, I was with a group of women, one of whom was a film director, and that's another area where it is just staggering how few women have been allowed to ply their trade. So there are still very challenging areas, but I think in general... You know, there's a, a lot of progress that's been made. My, uh, my VC is at AOL. We are now a part of Verizon. They embraced my venture firm so quickly because they are so eager to, to recruit female engineers and the idea that we might be able to help with either recruitment, retention, or just all kinds of educational stuff uh, was, was really exciting to them. Um, And certainly AOL has had a very, very strong move. You know that. You've Mm -hmm. spent a lot of time there, a lot of women leaders at the company. Um, So there there are definitely big pluses, I think, right now. When we continue, both women talk about why it's so hard to get more diversity in the workforce. Plus, what changes once you become the boss? This episode of Radiate is brought to you by Stamps.com. With the holidays just around the corner, you don't have time to go to the post office. You don't want to get into traffic, parking, not to mention that everybody will be at the post office mailing their holiday gifts and packages. So instead, use Stamps.com. With Stamps.com, you can avoid all the hassle of going to the post office during this busy holiday season. Everything you would do there, you can do right from your desk. You can buy and print official U.S. postage using your own computer and printer. You can print postage for any letter or package the instant you need it. Then you just wait for the mailman to pick it up. It's that easy and convenient. 
right now. Sign up for Stamps.com. Use the promo code RADIATE for this special offer. It's a four-week trial plus a $110 bonus offer. That includes postage and your own digital scale. You can weigh your packages. So don't wait. Go to Stamps.com before you do anything else. Click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in RADIATE. That's Stamps.com. Enter RADIATE. This week's episode of Radiate is also brought to you by Earth Class Mail. Earth Class Mail moves your snail mail to the cloud. It gives you instant access 24-7, and it integrates with the tools and the services that you already use every day. It's crazy, right, when you think about it. We've moved everything that we do for our business over to the digital world, but still we need to pick up and sort and manage our physical paper mail. But with Earth Class Mail, you can get all of your mail scanned and accessible online 24-7. You can search your mail. You can send invoices over to your accounting software. You can even sync up important documents right into the cloud, deposit checks, and really just make running your business a whole lot easier. You can also get a real professional address to share publicly with your customers, business partners, and investors. So you'll never need to worry about somebody showing up at your front door if you run your business from your home. Earth Class Mail is a brilliant solution that is perfect for businesses and independent entrepreneurs of all types. So visit earthclassmail.com slash radiate and you'll get your first month of service free when you sign up. That's earthclassmail.com slash radiate. You know, it's both men and women who need to help advance, right? Um, other women in their careers. So I, I don't want this to become like a, a male bashing thing because it by far is not. So how do we, you know, how do we then bring on the men on board to help build women leaders? Uh, because, you know, some of those, as you say, in some of those industries, um, those stereotypes still exist, those biases. So how do you, you know, how do you change that? How do you, how do you bring, you know, how do you bring everybody on board? I think a lot of it really comes down to networking amongst folks within your organization and forming what feel mm-hmm. like natural relationships. I think that's one thing that men tend to be very focused on. I know you wrote that great piece that you sent us this morning about how that was something you had to learn to do. Um, and I remember in a lot of my earlier roles and in, in my early career, noticing that a lot of my male peers were much better about forging just personal relationships with a lot of our superiors, finding, you know, you know, areas of personal interest that they could, you know, re- both relate to. And essentially, I don't think that it's sometimes rocket science. People who like you will want to help you. Um, so I remember being um, in one of my earlier roles in, in banking. I was actually assigned a mentor, um, and they assigned me the literally the only other woman who was in my group in the bank, um, in my group in the bank. And she was great. We just, we did not have a particularly strong personal connection. There was a director who sat behind me who I immediately clicked with who was male and we got along really, really well. And we, you know, we shared common interests in food and in movies and in all of these other topics. And he really ended up being my, not formal, but my informal mentor who helped me significantly in my career and helped me think about, you know, what are some of the projects that I wanted to work on, how I could help advance my career. I know was the person pounding the table for me when they came to talk about bonuses and year-end raises and all of those things. And it, it really is very much about finding those personal connections and finding someone who believes in you and naturally feels that pull to want to be a help to you. I do notice that, you know, the men are very like outward, like they, they network, they network all the time, but, but a lot of women don't do that. And I don't know why. I don't know why. So what is it? Well, again, I'm, I'm going to be um, the outlier here because I see women doing it so much more now. It's just incredible how there is, there's not a young woman in my company around me who is not looking for mentors and already has a few. Um, but one thing I would say that I just want to turn the mentor thing on its head a little bit because I think it can, it's very useful. Um, I think having peer mentors is also very useful. People you can go to who are um, your stage, your age, and who can be a backstop and really someone you can. Uh, you can run things by when you're not sure how you should respond. But more than that, a a better way to mentor or to network is often 
to volunteer for someone else's project, right? Get yourself around the company by looking for places that are understaffed or projects that are really interesting that obviously need more help and volunteer. And you will make the best relationships that way. It's also um, a, a skill that I think is really, really important to be able to, to work across departments and to, to develop relationships with people who are not your direct reports or who you don't report to. Those tend to be more valuable relationships long term. So I would just turn it a little bit and say, don't just go to people and say, I'd like you to be my mentor. Go to people and say, I want to help. And those will be lasting relationships. Uh, Let's also flip the idea of um, leadership around, because right now we've been talking about it mostly from the angle of, you know, you wanting to be a leader and you wanting to ask for the raise. But what about for employers, though? And we've got several people here, men and women, who are employers as well. So how do they how do they help cultivate women in their organizations? Yeah. So, I mean, I think for us, the, the fact that we sell a product that very naturally lends itself towards women, we tend to get a lot of women who want to come in and work for us, to be per- perfectly honest. I'm sure you saw a similar yeah. thing at Gilt. But, you know, I think in terms of mentorship, we are very, um, very, very focused on how we get women comfortable speaking up for themselves and standing up for themselves. And again, I think we benefit from the fact that both Amy and I came from very male-dominated workplaces where we got very, very comfortable very quickly with, if you want something, you go ask for it or you don't get it. And you have to feel very comfortable standing up for yourself and speaking your mind um, and hearing other people out and working collaboratively. Uh, But, you know, this is not a workplace for wallflowers. We want everybody to feel really comfortable coming in and speaking up. But but how do you exactly do that, though? I mean, describe to me the actual like mechanism by which you do that. Yeah. So we, um, we do a lot of cross-functional team meetings and a lot of times, um, we will specifically ask somebody to render an opinion. So if we are having a marketing meeting, for example, if there is someone who is more on the junior side, who tends to be more shy, we will really try to coax them out of their shell and really get them comfortable with this idea of, you know, we don't subscribe to a traditional hierarchy. We really want to hear what you think. We want you to participate. You are the target customer um, and really encouraging people to speak up and speak more freely and and really appreciate and love the fact that we do want to have a very collaborative environment. And sometimes you do have to encourage people to to participate in that way. And we have some people who come in at guns blazing and they are ready to give you their opinion on just everything. Um, And then there are some people who come in who perhaps, you know, aren't used to a startup environment. They're used to a more traditional environment where you you sit in meetings and if you aren't at a certain level, you are not supposed to speak up and say what you think. Um, and you you have to coax that out. And I, I don't know that there's necessarily a formula to it because you have to be a little bit sensitive to people's backgrounds and where they come from and what they're used to and, and how you get them really used to, you know, our environment. And a lot of it, I really think, does come from, um, you know, mirroring what you see um, and mirroring what you see other people doing. And I think as they see other people within the organization who are perhaps at their level or more junior feeling comfortable speaking up, having their ideas taken seriously and discussed in cross-functional meetings, it gets them more comfortable. I th- and, and I'm talking now to, to the men here who may be leading organizations, but um, I, I think that it only happens when you make it a priority your workforce is going to look to your lead. um, And if you are talking about the need to really uh, create a very diverse workforce, and I think that's the issue here, right? It's not that that women are better. It's that that diverse workforces work better. So um, when it starts at the top and when it is made a priority and the CEO of the company and the the leads of all divisions are talking about it on a regular basis and saying, we want to do this not because it's the right thing, but because it's good for the company and it's good for our business. And um, I, I, would, I would particularly say for businesses that are, are consumer-facing, that when you look at the fact that women are, are the end user, the end consumer of the vast majority of the consumer products out there, whether they're online or offline. It's really interesting to me 
that Facebook is about 57% female, Twitter's a little over 60%, Snapchat and and Instagram, almost 70% female user base. Um, Pinterest, obviously, over the top. Uh, <laughs> um, but that, plus the fact that we are on social sites more frequently, we use our, our, our mobile phones more and for more things. So if you are trying to sell any product out there, not having women on your team, not having women who are really in a position to be able to speak up and to, to add to whatever the marketing campaign, product development, whatever it might be, um, you're missing a huge opportunity. Since both of you run your own firms, you've been CEO or you are CEOs or have been also been people who have you know been worked for CEOs. I want to know what changes, Daniela, when you become the boss. Um, so this is, I mean, this is my first experience, really, you know, being the boss. I mean, before this, I literally answered to like eight layers of people. Um, I, I think that the biggest thing that changes is. I think that going in, I had no idea what would be the biggest and most important challenges that we would face, um, meaning, and, and to be more specific, it's like 75 to 80 percent of my time at this point is really, really focused on team, culture, HR, um, bringing in the best possible people that we can evangelizing for the company and making sure that they absolutely love it with us, that they feel challenged with us, and they don't ever want to leave. And they're going to evangelize for us, and they're going to bring in the strongest workforce possible. And I think, you know, looking back, you know, four and a half years ago, literally sitting in Amy's business school apartment, packing up boxes and walking them down to the local USPS, I don't think I would have ever anticipated how much that can and should take up of your time and, and mental capacity. I mean, how about you, Susan? What, what changed when you became the boss? It's lonely, uh, honestly, because you do own everything and you're responsible for a whole lot of people who are, are, are depending on you to make the right decisions and to and to figure out how to keep growing this. So it's, um, it, it feels like it's, you know, dream come true. And on a certain level, that's, that's accurate. But, um, but it's tough work because most of the time you are dealing with things that have not gone as planned. Uh, I don't know how many of you have read Ben Horowitz's book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things, but I Love that highly book. recommend it. And uh, he talks about peacetime CEOs versus wartime CEOs. And by that, he means the CEOs who are leading during a period where the company has a pretty clear path and is growing and the world is a beautiful thing. And, and wartime CEOs who are there during turnarounds and when, um, when there's a constant crisis. And I've been at both. And it is both an honor and a privilege to lead a company of people. It is also a very lonely pursuit uh, because it, the buck stops there. Next week on Radiate, Robert Wolf, from blocking tackles on the football field to blocking attacks at the president. Meet the man who's made a name for himself on Wall Street and in politics. Wolf's fast become one of President Barack Obama's closest financial advisors and friends. So how did that relationship develop? And why is Wolf's Rolodex the envy of every banker in town? Hear his advice on how to get to anyone, anywhere, any place. All that and much more in the next episode of Radiate. Thanks for joining us. I'm Betty Lou. If you liked what you heard, please, please review us on iTunes and find me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. See you next week on Radiate.